I've been rescued from a life of chaos on three occasions. Gunny Hopkins and Mrs. Hopkins rescued me twice, intervening on each occasion to redirect a life spiraling into the toilet. The third rescue came about in a completely different fashion, but it has every prospect of lasting for a lifetime. My name is David Durr. Folks who know me well call me Davy. I spent 12 years of my life in foster care. I never knew my father. I'm not certain my mother even knew who my sperm donor was. If she did, she never told me or my grandmother. My mother was an addict. I spent the first six years with her dropping in and out of my life, although it was more out than in. Most of that time my grandmother was caring for me. Grandmom died shortly before I started first grade, relinquishing my care to my heroin-addicted mother. My time in mom's custody turned out to be very short. I came home from school about two months after my grandmother's death to find my mother asleep in the bed, a needle sticking out of her arm. I tried repeatedly to wake her. Experience told me that sometimes she just needed to sleep it off and so I waited. I ended up waiting for three days, feeding myself on whatever I could find in the refrigerator and the box of cereal I climbed up on a chair to get out of the cabinet. After I failed to turn up for school for the third consecutive day and mom failed to answer the phone, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Gallagher, showed up with her patrolman husband to check on me. When they knocked on the door, I wasn't going to let them in, until Mrs. Gallagher finally convinced me it was okay. I told them mommy was sleeping and Mrs. Gallagher went to check on her. She called her husband into the bedroom. He confirmed that my mother was dead. They then called children and youth services and I was scooped up into the foster care system. Years after my foster care experience, a woman named Naomi Schaefer Riley wrote a book called No Way to Treat a Child. It's an indictment of the foster care system. My only problem with her conclusions is that she wasn't nearly harsh enough about how destructive that system is to a child trapped in it. CYS made some desultory efforts to locate relatives with whom they could place me. If I had any living family, I never knew any of them. This was long before the whole fascination with genetic testing and searching for relatives in the various online databases became popular, so it was mostly going through my mother's things to see if there were any names or phone numbers. CYS drew a blank and off I went to long-term care in a mightily flawed system. When I later tallied up the total, I calculated that I'd been fostered by 12 different families in 9 separate schools by the time I reached age 14. I wasn't a difficult or rebellious child, but several of the foster care families were almost as dysfunctional as my own had been. And many of them were just in it for the payment they got for keeping me. I saw all kinds of chicanery, bullying, physical and just plain neglect. The families with multiple foster children and children of their own were the worst. There was a decidedly two-tiered standard of care in those families, with their natural children strongly favored. Those years of my life were chaotic, to say the least, and I was on a fast track to a life of dysfunction when Gunny and Mrs. H intervened. I first met Gunny Hopkins in freshman gym class. He was African-American, a retired Marine gunnery sergeant who had undertaken a second career as a high school gym teacher. He was probably in his late 40s when I first encountered him. Meeting him was memorable. The guy was about 6 feet 4 inches tall and weighed nearly 240. If there was an ounce of fat on his body, it was well hidden. He scared the living daylights out of every boy in the student body, not the least because his side gig after school was owning and operating a martial arts studio in a strip center near the high school. Several of the people I met had trained with him and they told me that he had a wall full of trophies from martial arts tournaments, although he no longer competed. No one I ever met at school had even a passing thought of giving him grief. Mrs. Hopkins was a school guidance counselor, responsible for the freshman class. She stood about 5 feet 2 inches and probably weighed no more than 110 pounds. She had Gunny H wrapped around her little finger. I didn't learn until later that they had three children, two boys and a girl. The boys were both marine officers and the girl was still in college, majoring in early childhood education. I would subsequently learn that as intimidating as Gunny Hopkins was, he didn't hold a candle to Mrs. H when she got wound up. She was a freaking force of nature when that happened. I would also subsequently learn that Gunny and Mrs. H were qualified as foster parents, a legacy of their caring for a niece whose parents had been addicts and lost custody of her. They had successfully finished raising her and the niece was now married to a Marine NCO and had two children. 
I had arrived at the latest foster family a few weeks before beginning my freshman year of high school. They were not one of the better families into whose care I had been deposited. The father was an alcoholic, short-tempered and quick to lash out. The family had just had two foster children age out and they had depended on the monthly revenues from those children for their care to make ends meet. Between the alcohol, the temper, the financial strains, and the short time I had to adjust to latest living arrangements, I expected trouble. It came about two weeks after I started high school. My unstable foster care history had left me woefully behind my peers educationally. On my initial high school assessment test, I'd scored as a fifth grader in reading and a fourth grader in math. That guaranteed me a meeting with Mrs. H shortly after I arrived at her school. The meeting was intended to map out an individual education plan to bring me up to grade level. It turned out to be a great deal more than that. The morning before I met with Mrs. H, my foster father had gone off on me. He'd misplaced his wallet and accused me of stealing it. When I couldn't produce it, he'd beaten me, leaving me bruised from shoulders to waist, splitting my lower lip and blackening an eye. I'd managed to escape and had gone to school, expecting a normal day. I'd either forgotten or never known about the meeting with Mrs. H. When my homeroom teacher told me to report to guidance in place of my first period class, I walked down the hall and entered her office. The next 30 minutes changed my life completely. I'd done the new student drill so often that I could narrate both sides of the conversation. As a foster kid in a new school, I was accustomed to a cursory interview and an immediate relegation to hopeless, don't waste time on this one response. Perhaps it was cynical of me, but the last thing I expected when I walked in her door was for Mrs. H to actually care about me. I had taken a seat with the chair turned to hide the side of my face that my foster father had hit. She opened our conversation by asking me to look at her. When she saw my face, she gasped. What happened to you? I was well acquainted with the need to conceal foster care failings. I fell. Bullshit. There's no way those injuries resulted from a fall. Don't lie to me. If you don't tell me who hit you, I'm calling the police. I hesitated. She glared at me. She picked up her phone, hit 9 for an outside line and dialed 9 to 1 and held her finger over the third button ready to complete the 911 call. I folded. My foster father thought I'd stolen his wallet. He was drunk and lost his temper. Did he hit you anywhere else? He beat me across the back. It's pretty sore. Stand up and turn around. I did as she asked. Lift your shirt. I pulled my t-shirt up to my shoulders. Good God. How often has he done this to you? This is the first time. I've only been there a couple of weeks. Sit down. I need to make some calls. To my surprise, her first call was not to the principal, the police, or CYS. She called her husband. George, I need you in my office. Now. It was the first indication I had of just how much control she had over Gunny H. Gunny H arrived within moments. She told him what she had seen, then said, what are we going to do about this? Gunny H was no fool and he'd known his wife a long time. She clearly had something in mind. What do you want to do? I think he already knew what was coming. This child needs a new foster home, today. We're qualified and we have three empty bedrooms. Unless you object, I'm going to call CYS and get him moved today. Denny simply nodded his approval, then stood behind me as his wife called CYS. The conversation was brutal. I'd never seen a tiny little woman radiate power like she did on that call. She didn't ask the CYS staffer she was dealing with. She told them what they were going to do. And she told them they were going to do it now. That kind of responsiveness was not my experience with CYS. I couldn't believe it was going to happen. Much to my astonishment, it did. When she finished that call, she looked at her husband and said, we'll need to get this child's clothing and other things from that house. We'll go after school. Turning to me, she said, meet me here after your last class. We'll go get your things. Turning to her husband, she said, George, get one of your cop buddies from the studio to go with us. We want there to make sure things don't get out of hand. 
I looked at Gunny H and couldn't imagine how the latest foster father might give him the slightest bit of trouble. But I kept my mouth shut, not wanting to look a gift horse in the mouth. If Mrs. H pulled this off, my life was going to take a huge turn for the better. Don't screw this up by opening your mouth, I told myself. Mrs. H sent me back to class, telling me. We'd reconvene later to discuss my IEP. I went through the day as usual, getting a couple of comments on my facial injuries, but otherwise it was a fairly standard school day. When the day ended, I went to my locker, got my things to go home, and reported to Mrs. H's office as instructed. Gunny H and an equally large cop were waiting there as well. The relocation went about as smoothly as it could have. Between Gunny H and the cop, the intimidation factor kept my foster father from demonstrating the slightest objections to my leaving. I gathered my limited wardrobe and the couple of other things I owned and placed them in Gunny H's car. He drove me to his house, helped me unload, and moved me into an empty bedroom. I didn't know it at the time, but the next four years would make me a whole new person. Life with Gunny and Mrs. H, as they told me to call them at home, was radically different from any prior foster care experience. They were the first people to care about me since my grandmother. From day one, they made clear that there was going to be structure, hard work, both educationally and physically, and discipline. Mrs. H dedicated her evenings to bringing my academics up to grade level. By the time I reached age 18, I was taking college prep courses and doing well in them. I'd never be the valedictorian, but I could hold my own in every class I took. A's and B's were expected, anything lower meant more hours of study. And Gunny H put me through an equally vigorous physical training program. He hauled me out of bed at 5.30 each morning for a five-mile run. And he undertook to provide a rigorous martial arts training program, which he combined with strength and flexibility conditioning. By the time I completed high school, I was 5 feet 10 inches tall, 160 pounds, and in the best shape of anyone I knew except Gunny H. I turned 18 shortly before I graduated, which meant I'd aged out of the foster care system. I had been working part-time at the martial arts studio, training elementary school-age students. After the graduation party, Gunny H sat me down and asked me what my plans for the future were. I told him I wanted to be a Marine. He asked me if I were sure, as the military involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan were both at their height. I said I was. He and Mrs. H took me down to the Marine Corps recruiter's office, where I enlisted. I had a month before reporting to Paris Island for boot camp. Gunny H put me through an even more rigorous training program than that I'd previously experienced, so I wouldn't embarrass him to any of his buddies who were drill instructors there. I would never tell a DI this, but after four years of living with the Hopkins and training with Gunny H, Paris Island was almost like a vacation. I graduated with honors, carrying the company guidance in the graduation parade. Gunny and Mrs. H were in the stands watching me. By this time, I thought of them as my parents, and I was proud to show them what a good job they'd done raising me. My intent upon enlisting had been to make the Marine Corps a career, but a Taliban with an RPG put an end to that notion. I was nearing the end of my first enlistment and had been promoted to sergeant. I was the squad leader for a security detail, providing protection to our battalion commander when he met with one of the local village chieftains about funding a clean water project in their village. On the way back to base, the convoy was attacked. My squad was riding in the lead vehicle. The battalion commander and three of his staff members were in the middle vehicle and another squad from my platoon was bringing up the rear. The Taliban must have had eyes on the convoy when we mounted up to leave the village, because they hit the middle vehicle with the RPG rather than mine. It went up in flames. I dismounted, spread my squad out in a perimeter and had them begin firing on the attacking force. With that force engaged, I ran to the middle vehicle and began pulling wounded out of it. The first guy I reached was the battalion commander. I got two of his staff out and was going back for another when the vehicle's fuel tanks exploded. Because of my body armor and helmet, my legs took the brunt of flames, leaving me with some interesting scars that guaranteed I wouldn't be wearing shorts very often in public. The force of the explosion also threw me into a low wall, knocking me out, breaking several ribs and shattering both bones in my lower right leg. When I came to, I was on a medevac flight to a hospital in Germany. By the time my leg had healed, the Marine Corps had given me a Navy Cross, a Purple Heart, 
an assembly of plates and pins to hold my leg bones together and a medical discharge with a 40% disability rating. They paid my way back to my home of record, which was Gunny and Mrs. H's house, the place which I and they considered my home. When I got home, Mrs. H asked me what I planned to do with the rest of my life. I was 22 years old, had trained as a rifleman, could teach martial arts, but had no real marketable skills. To her surprise, I told her I wanted to go to college and become a history teacher at the high school level. Gunny had forced me to set aside a huge chunk of my monthly pay in a college fund when I enlisted, so between those funds, the GI Bill benefits and my disability pension, college would be affordable. There was a decent state college with a fine history program and a well-thought-of education department about an hour from the Hopkins house. Mrs. H helped me apply. Because I was 22 and had been living on my own for four years, I leased a small apartment about 15 minutes walk from campus rather than think about living in the dorms with a bunch of college students. I registered as a double major in history and education and began knocking off my mandatory prerequisite courses, one of which was a freshman biology course, which included a weekly three-hour lab. Because I was neither living in the dorms nor participating in Greek life or sports, I knew no one in my biology class. The instructor told us we would need to pick a lab partner. Since I was not the standard 18-year-old student, I didn't find anyone gravitating toward me. When the instructor asked at the end of the hour who didn't have a partner, only one other person raised her hand. It was a reasonably attractive woman sitting a few rows forward of me. The instructor told us to team up, exchange contact information, and dismissed the class. I walked down the center aisle and introduced myself to the woman. Hi, I'm Davy Durr. She stared at me, saying nothing. I went on, if we're going to be lab partners, we'll need to exchange contact information. If you'll give me your name and phone number, I'll give you my info. She continued to stare. Miss, we need to do this. Please. I don't bite and I promise not to share it. Finally, she said, my name is Vera McDonald. My telephone number is 555-555-1212. She then gave me her email address as well. I did the same, then told her I'd see her at the lab session and went on to my next class. Vera turned out to be a bit of a strange duck. She had the highest, thickest walls around her that I think I'd ever encountered in a person. Getting to know her was like trying to chisel granite with a plastic spoon. We'd gone through most of the semester without her disclosing a single fact about herself despite spending three hours a week together in the biology lab. I tried without success to breach those walls, finally just giving up when it became clear that she would never open up. Then, shortly before Thanksgiving break, I was talking to one of the guys at the next lab station about our respective plans when Vera walked in. What are you doing over the break, he'd asked. I'll be staying at my apartment for most of it trying to get a leg up on next semester's workload. I'll probably go to my foster parents' house for Thanksgiving Day, then come back here. They live about an hour away and I haven't seen them since school started. Vera had come to a sudden stop as I mentioned foster parents. She looked at me and said, are you a foster kid, too? Suddenly, it all fell into place. I knew what a trial foster care had been for me and I'd lucked out being male and ending up with the Hopkins. I had seen some of the horrors visited upon female foster children, particularly the ones who were attractive. Vera tried to hide it with the baggy clothing she typically wore, but I'd noticed that she was a good-looking girl. Had the wall not been there, I'd already have asked her out. Since this was the first time she'd opened even the tiniest crack in her armor, I approached carefully. I was in foster care from age 6 to age 18. I was in 13 foster homes. The last one was for four years. I consider Gunny and Mrs. Hopkins as my parents, even though they never adopted me. Vera said, I went into foster care at age two. My dad had disappeared. My mom died of cancer. I didn't have any relatives who were willing to take me in. It wasn't a pleasant experience. I bounced around like a pinball. I was lucky to get out of the system and not end up in jail. Fortunately, I had teachers who watched out for me and a decent caseworker. They got me the scholarship to attend here. I'm majoring in accounting. I plan to find a job that will provide me with the maximum financial security that I can get with an accounting degree. 
I figure the world will always need bean counters, so I'll never lack for work. Good plan, I replied. I'm majoring in history and education. Gunny H is a high school teacher and Mrs. H is a guidance counselor. They rescued me from a really bad foster home and got me straightened out. I served in the Marine Corps for four years after high school, which I why I'm just a freshman now. We continued to talk as we turned back to the lab work. When we finished the lab, I asked Vera, would you like to go get something to eat? I'm starving. My budget doesn't really let me eat anywhere but the dining hall. Come on, it's on me. No pressure, but let me do this, one foster kid to another. I've got the wherewithal. You can reciprocate sometime when you're flush. And with that, Vera entered my life as something other than a lab partner. For the rest of the semester, I worked on opening Vera up further. We weren't dating, but we became study buddies, spending considerable time together in the library. I had learned to cook from Mrs. H, so I had Vera over for a home-cooked meal at least twice a week. We caught a few college sports events together and I took her out to dinner one evening. In all that time, I never so much as touched her, except to help her off or on with her coat. The schedule that the Hopkins had put me on had left very little time for dating in high school. I dated some in the Marine Corps, but it was more hookups than anything resembling a relationship. So, I really didn't have much in the way of relationship building skills to fall back on. It was clear Vera didn't either. Although she had opened up to a degree, there was always a barrier keeping me from really getting inside the castle keep. I could tell she was driven primarily by a need to feel secure, financially, physically, and emotionally. She wasn't going to let anyone in to disturb that security. Getting her to a point where we could have a real relationship was going to be a challenge. But despite that, perhaps because I understood why she was that way, I kept trying. I found myself falling in love with her, as stupid as that sounds. It was Christmas break that finally changed our entire dynamic, moving us from friends to lovers. The college closed completely for three weeks at Christmas, beginning the week before the holiday and continuing through the week after New Year's. I hadn't really thought about what Vera was going to do over that the break, until she knocked on my door with a garbage bag full of her stuff in hand. Davy, she said, can I stay with you over Christmas break? They're closing the dorm tonight and I don't have enough money for a hotel. Shit, I thought. What an idiot I am. Vera doesn't have any place to go over the holidays. I should have been the one asking her to come stay with me. I'm a jackass. Sure, I said. Let me put clean sheets on the bed. You can sleep there. I'll sleep out here on the sofa. I've done it plenty of times when I've fallen asleep in front of the TV. I'll get you some towels and a washcloth. I'm not going to put you out of your own bed. We can share. I trust you not to try to take advantage of me. After all, we're both foster kids and we've both probably shared a bed before. Vera did have a point, although it had been a long time since I'd shared a bed with anyone except a hookup. And there hadn't been any of them for almost a year, between my recovery from my injuries and the first semester of college. But if she was willing, I was willing. Who knows? I told myself. Maybe we can be more than just friends. I helped her move her stuff into my bedroom, cleared a drawer and some closet space for her clothes and welcomed her to Shea Davy. Our first night was a bit awkward. I'd been accustomed to sprawling all over the double bed, something that wouldn't work with Vera sharing it. I didn't own any pajamas, generally sleeping in boxer shorts and a t-shirt. That wasn't going to work either, so I went to bed in a pair of sweatpants over my boxers. Vera must have had a great deal of faith in my sense of self-restraint because she popped out of the bathroom in t-shirt and a skimpy pair of shorts. From the bounce under the t-shirt, it was clear there was nothing on underneath. I was hard before she even hit the bed. I tried. I really did. I started the night rolled over on the edge of the bed facing away from Vera. I don't know when or how it happened, but by morning I was rolled over and spooning her, with my arm draped over her hugging her close to me with my hand on her breast. When I awoke, I was hard as a rock and poking into her ass. Apparently, Vera had been awake for a while. I'm so sorry, I told her. I didn't mean to be a pervert. Vera laughed. 
Don't worry about it. It's nice having someone cuddle up to me. I don't think I've ever just snuggled with someone before. I could get used to this. And with that, she rolled over, wrapped her arms around me, and kissed me, morning breath and all. I wasn't prepared for that, or for what followed. Without so much as a by your leave Vera sat up and pulled her t-shirt off over her head, tossing it onto the floor beside her. Then she rolled over on top of me and resumed our kiss, forcing her tongue into my mouth. I was tempted. I mean really, really tempted, to follow where she was leading, but at the last minute, virtue triumphed, at least for the moment, over vice. I pushed her away and said, Vera, you don't have to do this. I'm your friend. I'm not looking to have you repay me for crashing here by sleeping with me. I won't do this unless you are serious about our having a relationship. I'm not going to blow our friendship over a quick hookup. I really like you. I'd love for us to be more than friends. But we are not going to be fuck buddies or a one-night stand. You mean too much to me for us to do something like that. I knew from my foster care days that a lot of foster care kids, particularly girls, treated sex as just an extended form of handshake, something to get them what they wanted or a way to say thank you to someone who'd done something for them. It could be completely meaningless. Just a way to earn points or get out of trouble. My time with Gunny and Mrs. H had given me a different perspective. I'd seen the two of them in a meaningful, loving relationship and I wanted one of them for my own. In my mind, I had begun to picture Vera as the other person in that relationship, foolish as that might be. I don't think anyone had ever told Vera no to an offer of sex. I had no idea how long she'd been sexually active, but I was pretty sure that she had not been seeing anyone since starting school. As far as I could tell, I was her only friend on campus. The only reason she'd let me inside the wall she directed was our common foster kid background. Vera stared at me for a long while. Then she said, Davy, sometimes you are just too nice for your own good. Here I am offering you the chance to enjoy me and you're turning me down. Are you for real? It isn't easy for me to do. I'm extremely fond of you. Perhaps even a bit in love with you. I've fanaticized about being with you. But until you feel the same way about me that I feel about you, the answer is going to be no. If I told you that I'm a little bit in love with you, too, would you do it? Only if I believed you were being honest with me and not just trying to make me feel good about doing it. You are an exasperating man, Davy Durr. And with that, she got out of bed, picked up her t-shirt, and walked into the bathroom with a change of clothes to shower and brush her teeth. When she finished, I did the same. Things were a bit frosty between us for the rest of the day. That night, instead of the t-shirt and shorts, Vera went to bed in a set of sweats. There was still nothing on underneath as nearly as I could tell, but I think she was making a statement. The following morning, I went out for a run, taking my phone. When I finished, I called Mrs. H. Hi Mrs. H. Are we still on for Christmas dinner? Of course, Davy. Why would you even ask? I know it's rude, but do you think there's room for one more at the table? My lab partner from biology is a foster kid and she has nowhere to go for Christmas. She's bunking with me over the break because the dorms are closed. I'd hate to leave her all alone on Christmas Day. The more, the merrier. Bring her along. We'll make sure she enjoys a nice dinner and some time with our family. Thanks Mrs. H. Can we bring anything? Just the two of you. See you then. Bye. Later that day, I went out to pick up a pizza. On the way, I stopped at a local jewelry store and bought a small necklace with a tiny figurine dangling from the chain. Since Vera was going to join the Hopkins clan for Christmas Day, I wanted to make sure she had a present to open. I didn't know it at the time, but that necklace would turn out to be the first Christmas present she'd ever received that hadn't come from a foster care agency or charity. The gift of that necklace turned out to be the nudge that tipped Vera's and my relationship over the edge from friends to lovers. When I handed her the present, she opened it, then started to cry. And then she jumped into my lap in front of everyone and kissed me like I'd never been kissed before. When we got back to my apartment that night, she dragged me into the bedroom and told me that she wanted us to have a relationship. Vera never did move back into the dorm. 
When the dorms reopened, we moved all her stuff into my apartment and began living together. I'm not sure Gunny and Mrs. H were completely on board with our being together. They had reservations about how quickly we'd moved from being lab partners to living together, but they were happy for us and accepted Vera as part of the family. The next three and a half years sped by. Vera did spectacularly well in her accounting studies, graduating at the top of her class and landing an incredible job with a big four accounting firm in Philadelphia. I managed to find a teaching position at a suburban high school, teaching history to 9th and 10th graders. We were married shortly after graduation. Just a small wedding, with Gunny H as my best man and Mrs. H as the matron of honor. At the reception, Gunny H handed me a card. When I opened it, there was a check in the amount of all the foster care payments he and Mrs. H had received for my care. With those funds as a down payment, we bought a small house near a SEPTA train line into the city, allowing Vera to commute by rail. Her hours were a lot longer than mine, and she had to travel regularly to audit clients, but we were almost deliriously happy. For the first time since I'd met her, Vera seemed settled, confident in our relationship and secure in where she was in her life. We'd been married about four and a half years when Vera's firm was engaged by the US government to conduct an audit of a major defense contractor accused by a whistleblower of a massive fraudulent billing on a cost-plus contract. The whistleblower's claim was that the contractor had faked hundreds of millions, perhaps even a billion, dollars in costs, with a select group of executives pocketing the payments. The contractor was located in the Midwest and Vera's team spent weeks at a time, seven days a week, conducting the audit. She'd leave on a Sunday evening and be gone two or three weeks, then return home, recharge for a week, and go off again. She had gotten into the habit of giving me a wild evening of sex before each trip, and an equally wild evening upon return. We would speak every day while she was gone, engaging in phone sex if she was alone in her room or office, or just catching up if others were around. It wasn't perfect, but Vera was excited to be working on such an important project and the feedback from her bosses was overwhelmingly positive. This was the kind of project that could vault her toward a partnership sooner rather than later. The whistleblower was an accountant in his early 30s named Richard Wilson. He was the mid-level staffer primarily responsible for the accounting and billing on the Cost Plus contract. He had stumbled across payments to a subcontractor he had not recognized. When he had pulled a copy of the contract, he found that the services being invoiced were duplicative of another subcontractor. A methodical man, he dug deeper, discovering that the phony contractor was owned by a Cayman Islands corporation. With the help of a friend who was extremely tech-savvy, he'd hacked into the computers of the Cayman Islands law firm that had established the Cayman Islands parent corporation and discovered that it was owned by four senior executives of the defense contractor. At that point, he'd engaged an attorney and filed a whistleblower claim against the defense contractor. All hell had broken loose. Vera spent days with Richard on each trip, following the trail of invoices and payments. He was entitled to a high eight-figure or low nine-figure payout if the whistleblower claim proved out, which it eventually did. I had no idea at the time, but Richard had developed a serious interest in Vera. And when Vera recognized that Richard was looking at an enormous award when the investigation was completed, she began to think that he offered a far more secure future than that which we shared. You can't blow the lid off a claim of that size without creating enemies. Richard created a host of them. Unfortunately for him, and ultimately, for me, some of them decided to deal with their problem by eliminating the source. After the third unsuccessful attempt on his life, the feds finally decided Richard needed to go into witness protection. Richard agreed but set one condition. He wanted Vera to go with him. Sometimes the husband really is the last to know. I would only discover years later what had been going through Vera's mind when she agreed to accompany Richard into the witness protection program. It wasn't the money, per se, but rather the security that the money offered combined with the oversight and protection of the U.S. Marshals Service. Vera's insecurities from a childhood spent in foster care overcame any qualms she might have about abandoning me. The day Vera disappeared started out like any other day when she was leaving to continue performing the audit. We'd engaged in wild monkey sex for hours the night before. It was almost as if she were trying to make sure I was taken care of for a long term. Our lovemaking had been even more intense than the usual goodbye sex we'd had prior to earlier trips. 
We've been talking about having a child and Vera had stopped taking her birth control pills shortly before her previous trip. I put the additional fervor of our lovemaking down to her attempting to get pregnant before the trip. The following morning she'd caught the train for the office with her bags and briefcase and I'd gone off to school. It was the last time I ever saw or spoke to her. The security cameras in front of Vera's office would later show her leaving the office as if heading for the airport. A black SUV with temporary tags picked her up and whisked her away. When I didn't hear from her for a couple of days, I began to be concerned. Phone calls went to voicemail. Emails went unopened. Text messages weren't generating a response. This had never happened before. I became very worried that something had happened. I finally called Vera's office to find out what was going on. They told me that she was on vacation. Vacation? No way. She'd been clear she was flying out to the Midwest after working all day. Had they heard from her? No, they hadn't. Now frantic with worry, I reported Vera as a missing person. The local police were sympathetic, but not convinced that my concerns were warranted. After all, Vera was an adult. Had we quarreled? Did she have a lover? Perhaps she'd lost her phone. Or maybe she was just too busy to deal with a concerned husband. When it became clear that her phone was out of service, her laptop untraceable, her credit cards unused and our bank accounts untapped, the cops finally began to take me more seriously. Vera's employer turned over the recorded footage from the security cameras outside their offices, which revealed Vera entering the SUV. The temporary tags proved to be fake. No such tag number existed. Now the cops began a more extensive investigation. They questioned me for hours before confirming that I'd been in an after-school department meeting with 10 other teachers at the time Vera had entered the vehicle. They searched all through our house, investigated our finances, and concluded that there was no evidence at all of what had happened to my wife. She had just vanished from the face of the earth, a 21st century judge crater. I melted down completely. Although I'd recognized early in our marriage that Vera's feelings for me might never rise to the same level as mine for her, I had been sure she'd love me as much as she was able to, given the limitations resulting from her extensive foster care background. I couldn't believe that Vera had just left me. She'd taken none of the things that had meaning for her, except my first Christmas present, the necklace which she never removed even if she were wearing other jewelry. As I became more and more convinced that something terrible had happened to her, I began to drink to numb the pain. The school district had given me a leave of absence to deal with the loss and the school year was nearly over, so I would have the entire summer to recover from my loss. Or, I'd have the time to drink myself into a stupor on a regular basis. I chose the latter. When Vera had first disappeared, I'd been in daily contact with the Hopkins. As the time passed and there were no signs of what had happened to her, the contacts became less frequent. As I continued to spiral downwards, my contacts became sporadic. By the end of July that summer, I hadn't spoken to either Hopkins in almost a month. Mrs. H was concerned and so she did what she did best when she was concerned. She sent Gunny H over to find out how I was doing. I'd gone through the better part of a bottle of Jack Daniels the preceding evening and was passed out on the couch when Gunny H arrived. Initially, he rang the doorbell, which I ignored. Then he knocked. When I didn't respond, he began banging on the door and shouting. Goddammit Marine, open this fucking door right now. I was astonished and more than a little afraid. In Al. All the years I'd known him, I'd never heard him raise his voice or swear. I did the only possible thing. I opened the door. Gunny H took one look around my living room and asked, what in God's name happened here? It was a reasonable question. The living room and the kitchen both wore a collection of dirty dishes, carry-out food boxes, some still half full and rotting, and empty liquor bottles. I hadn't showered, shaved, or changed clothing for at least a week. You stink. Upstairs, now. Gunny dragged me up the stairs and tossed me into the shower, still fully clothed. Get that dirty crap off you and clean yourself up. While I was showering, Gunny called Mrs. H, he's drunk, filthy, let the place go to a pigsty and needs our help again. Can you get a couple of people over here to clean this mess up? 
I'll pack some clothes for him and drag him back to our place once he's done showering. Mrs. H agreed and Gunny H hung up and proceeded to pack my clothes in a duffel bag. The second rescue of Davy Durr by the Hopkins commenced. When we got to the Hopkins house, Gunny H dropped my stuff in the bedroom I'd used when I was a foster kid and then glared at me. You're better than this. We've put too much time and effort into you to let you fall apart. You've made way too much progress to crash and burn now. This shit stops right this minute. And Reveille is at 0530 tomorrow. We're going to start over again with you. And then he shut the door. The next morning was painful, to say the least. I hadn't run or done any exercise since Vera's disappearance. Gunny H set out on a five-mile run at a pace I'd have trouble matching on a good day and this was definitely not a good day. When we finished the run, he loaded me into his truck and took me over to the martial arts studio, where we lifted and stretched before sparring for an hour. By the time we were finished, I'd sweated all the booze out of my system and was totally wiped. This set the template for the remainder of the summer. By the time the school year started again, I was back in shape and my head was mostly in the right place. The district had a pretty good employee assistance plan and Mrs. H got me enrolled into twice a week counseling sessions. By Christmas, I was mostly back to my old self, except for the hole in my heart where Vera had once resided. The laws regarding missing persons in Pennsylvania required Vera to be gone for seven years before I could have her declared dead. Fortunately for me, Vera's overwhelming need for financial security had caused us to purchase a home that we could afford on just my salary and disability pension. In addition, she divided her salary between maxing out our retirement funding, making double payments to pay down the mortgage and saving the rest. Financially, I was fine, except that I couldn't sell the house or her car or access any of her retirement funds. Even so, I was in good enough financial shape that I didn't need a second income, although I was once again working as a trainer at the studio in addition to teaching. It was on a warm June day, just before the end of the school year, slightly over five years after Vera disappeared, that I heard my doorbell. When I opened the door, I discovered a man and a woman dressed in business casual clothing, one holding an accordion file. They each held up their credentials, then introduced themselves as Deputy U.S. Marshals Simpson and Wallach. What can I do for you? I asked. It was an honest question, because I had no idea what could have brought two U.S. Marshals to my front door. Perhaps they were at the wrong house? They asked if I were Davy Durr and was I the husband of Vera Durr. My heart sank. Had they finally found Vera, or more likely her remains? I confirmed that they had the right Davy Durr and invited them in, seating them in my living room and asking them if I could offer any refreshments or water. They said no. I asked them why they were here. They began to tell me a story that I found beyond comprehension. Wallach took the lead. Mr. Durr, we owe you a huge apology. The Marshal Service screwed up five years ago. We are here to apologize and try to rectify that screw-up. Now I was totally confused. She continued. Five years ago, the Marshal Service put a whistleblower you know as Richard Wilson into the Witness Protection Program. He discovered and reported one of the largest defense procurement frauds in U.S. history. Your wife was part of the team of auditors the government brought in to audit the defense contractor involved and track the funds. I indicated that this was familiar to me, as it had been the matter Vera was working on when she disappeared. Apparently, your wife and Mr. Wilson had developed a relationship and he insisted that she go with him into witness protection. She agreed to do so. But before she did, she insisted that everything possible be done to make her disappearance from your life as easy as possible. That included having a divorce petition drafted and signed giving you all the marital assets and all her individual assets, signing a deed disclaiming any interest in your house, signing over her car, and various other transfer documents. She also included a letter to you. All of this was supposed to be delivered to you once she and Mr. Wilson were safely relocated. Now I began to get angry. Are you telling me that my wife, who I've been mourning for five years, ran off with some guy she met on an audit? And you knew and didn't report it? The local cops are still carrying an open file on this. They've been spinning their wheels for five years and I've been in mourning for that long. I can't believe this. Wallach continued. We're truly sorry. 
This file was supposed to be delivered to you long ago. We only found it when we went back into our records after Mr. Wilson and your wife were killed. Killed? Are you saying that my wife is dead now? Yes, I am. They were relocated to Portland, Oregon after Mr. Wilson collected his whistleblower payout. They've been living quietly there until about two months ago. There was a home invasion and Mr. Wilson was killed during it. Your wife was badly injured and ended up in a coma. She lived about 35 days after Mr. Wilson died. Since she survived him for more than 30 days, his entire estate went to her. Your daughter and their other child are unharmed and in our custody. We didn't want to inform you or go public until we'd confirmed that the deaths of Vera and Richard weren't related to the whistleblower case. The Portland PD just arrested the home invaders based upon the footage from the house's security cameras, so we know who they were. They're just gangbangers, not professionals hired to eliminate Vera and Richard. It was purely random, not connected to the whistleblowing in any way. Wait a minute. Daughter? I don't have a daughter. Vera and I didn't have any children. Yes, you did. Vera was pregnant with your child before she went into witness protection. Your daughter is about four and a half. Her little brother is two. How do you know the girl is mine? After the little girl was born, Vera had a DNA test conducted on her. She didn't look like Wilson at all and Vera thought there was a chance she might have been conceived the last time the two of you were together. It turns out that she was correct. She deposited the DNA test with her attorney to keep along with her will. She was confident enough of your parentage to name you as guardian of the two children if something happened to both her and Richard. She also named you as the individual trustee of the trust created for the children. Their bank is the other trustee. That trust is currently valued at more than $100 million. You are also named as a beneficiary of Vera's estate to the tune of $5 million, contingent on your agreeing to take custody of both children and raising them as your own. And she also specified that you were to receive the necklace she wore daily, which you were to hold for Violet until she marries. You're to give it to her as a wedding gift from her mother. There are some other things you need to know. Although we relocated Richard and Vera with identities as husband and wife, her marriage to you was never terminated because you never filed a divorce petition nor had Vera declared dead. You are still legally her husband, or at least were until she died a few days ago. That means we can release Violet to you immediately. Samuel is more of a problem. We're creating a replacement birth certificate for him. Once we have that, we can deliver him at the same time without your going through the whole foster parent background check process. We'll substitute your name as father for Mr. Wilson's on both certificates and turn the children over to you. What do you say? What do I say? Are you fucking kidding me, pardon my French? You waltz into my house without warning, tell me my missing wife has been living with some guy under a different identity for five years and has just died, that I have a daughter I've never met who also has a half-brother, that these kids are rich beyond comprehension, and that you want me to take custody of both of them? Have you been listening to what you're saying? Some people in this room are nuts and I don't think one of them is me. As embarrassing as this is to admit, it's all true. We'd like to set up a meeting with the marshal's service to transfer the children to you and put you in touch with the law firm handling the estate. We would appreciate your keeping this under your hat until all the formalities have been taken care of. We know we made some huge errors in how this was all handled and we're really embarrassed and sorry beyond words. Some heads will roll for this, we promise. But the most important thing to address right now is the care of the children. So, are you in or not? As nearly as we can tell, there are no other relatives of either Richard or Vera. If you don't take these kids, they're going to end up in some sort of foster care. That was a low blow. I suspected that the two marshals were well aware of both mine and Vera's histories as foster children and had decided to play their trump card. Do as we ask or see two small children end up in a system you hated. I had no choice once they played that card. I'm in. When can I meet the children? The marshals left the folder containing the documentation Vera had asked the marshals service to prepare when she disappeared. I placed it on the desk in my office, deciding that it had been five years, so whatever was in there would keep a few more days. 
After the meeting with the marshals ended, I called the Hopkins. Without going into detail, I told them that I'd been contacted by federal law enforcement, that Vera was dead and that she'd left two children behind for whom I was now to become parent. I'll give this to both Gunny and Mrs. H. They never once asked me if I'd lost my mind, just started helping me plan to acquire all the things I'd need for my new role as bachelor father. Two days later, in a meeting at the federal courthouse in Philadelphia, Violet and Samuel were delivered to me, complete with birth certificates naming them as my children. I was now officially their father. A totally unprepared, bewildered, saddened and angry father, but a father nonetheless. Being younger, Samuel bonded with me almost immediately. It took Violet several weeks longer, but by the time the school year started in the fall, both were calling me daddy. I enrolled Violet and Samuel in the daycare facility near the high school used by most of the teachers with young children. The Hopkins dipped into their extensive contacts list to provide me with a pediatrician, babysitters with good reputations, and the assorted other resources a new father needs. I think they saw Violet and Samuel as two more grandchildren, much the same way they saw me as a son, if not a formally adopted one. The file sat on my desk for a month before I finally opened it one evening after putting the children to bed. In it I found all the documents that the marshals had mentioned, plus Vera's engagement and wedding rings and ten copies of a death certificate in her name that I would need to close out various accounts and transfer her retirement funds to my IRA. The necklace which I had given her that first Christmas together was also in the file. The marshals had recovered Vera's personal items from the hospital after she died and had made a point of adding that to the materials they'd given me. I spent a long time looking at the envelope containing Vera's last letter to me before opening it. I wasn't sure I wanted to know what she'd been thinking when she'd left me. Finally, I just bit the bullet, opened the envelope, and began reading. Dear Davy, By the time you receive this letter, I'll have disappeared. I'm sorry to do this to you, but I've attempted to make the process of dealing with my disappearing as easily as possible. Accompanying this letter are all the documents you'll need to remove me from your life and move on without me. I know that this is going to hurt you. For that, I can only express my deepest regret. You loved me unconditionally. I will always treasure that. I wish I could have done the same to you. I'm self-aware enough to recognize that I've never loved anyone. I'm not sure I have the capacity to love after all the years I spent in that damn foster care system. I know I'd never experienced love until I met you, except perhaps from a mother I have no recollection of. You were much stronger than I was because you survived the system with your capacity to love intact. I didn't. Perhaps the difference between us was a result of Gunny and Mrs. H's time with you, or perhaps it is just that you are the best man I've ever known. Leaving with Richard gives me the opportunity for a degree of physical and economic security that you and I could never have experienced. As a former foster child, I'm sure you understand the calculation. He and I will have enormous resources and be under the protection of the U.S. Marshals. Nothing you and I would ever have could begin to match that. I don't love Richard. I think he knows that. But he's in love with me and he's willing to take the chance that I might come to love him over time particularly if we have children together, as we plan to. So, my dear Davy, be angry, hate me if you must. I don't expect you to ever forgive me for what I'm doing. But I do hope you will look back on the insecurities of your own foster care existence to understand why I have made this decision. Please carve me out of your life and move on. Forget about me. Treat me as if I died. Mourn me if you must, but if you don't, I'll understand why you cannot. Somewhere out there is the woman who can give you the same kind of unconditional love that you gave to me but I could never give you. I hope you find her and the two of you can love and grow old together. I hope she gives you a house full of children and grandchildren, something I failed to do for you. Goodbye my dear, sweet Davy. Be well, move on with your life. May it be long, rich, and fulfilling. Vera. After I read the letter, I sat at my desk for a long time quietly weeping. The irony was almost overwhelming. She'd fled to a place where she thought she'd be secure and a random act of violence had destroyed her. My tears were not for my loss, but for the unrepairable damage a hellish system had done to the woman I'd loved so much, whose childhood experiences had kept her from the experience of ever truly loving another person. Vera's death meant that now she'd never have that experience. 
I put the letter into my safe and went to bed. I'll never understand why anyone would want to be a single parent. At least by the time Violet and Samuel came into my life, they were past the waking every two hours stage. Nevertheless, I found myself exhausted at the end of the day after teaching all day and then caring for them at night. I finally dipped into the funds Vera had left to me to hire a full-time housekeeper slash nanny, a delightful 50-something Mexican immigrant named Maria who immediately commenced to teach the children Spanish and lavished her love and affection on them as if she were their grandmother. By the time the kids had been with me for a year, we were a family. The summer following the Marshall's visit, I took the kids and Maria to Ocean City, New Jersey for two weeks. I gave Maria a generous amount of time to herself while I took the kids to the beach and the boardwalk. We all had a blast and were sorry to see our vacation end. My next-door neighbors at the time Vera and I purchased the house had been two seventy-somethings. Earlier that summer, they informed me that they were putting their house up for sale and moving to Texas to be closer to their daughter and grandchildren. The house sold quickly, the closing occurring while we were at the beach. I had not yet met the new neighbors when Violet came in from the backyard with a request. Daddy, can Teddy come play on our jungle gym? Who's Teddy? He's the new boy next door. Has his mommy or daddy said it's okay for him to come over? I haven't seen them. Well, let's go ask. It's time I met the new neighbors anyway and this is as good an excuse as any. And so next door we went. I rang the doorbell and after a brief wait, it was answered by an attractive 30-something brunette in a set of paint-spattered dungarees and an equally paint-spattered t-shirt. May I help you, she asked. Hi, I said. I'm Davy Durr from next door. We just got home from the shore yesterday. Violet here is my daughter and I have a son, Samuel. They were playing on our jungle gym and your little boy wanted to join them. I wanted to make sure you were okay with it before letting him come over. Hi, said the woman. I'm Carol Schick. I just moved in a week ago and you caught me in the middle of painting my son Teddy's room. Are you sure you don't mind having him play with your daughter and son? No, that's... Fine. We'll keep him entertained and let you get your painting done without having to worry about him. Let me give you my phone number and you can call me when you want him to come home. Or just come over and give a yell. I'll probably be in the backyard with the kids. With that, she thanked me and walked out of the house to tell Teddy he could go next door to play with Violet and Samuel. The kids meshed as if they'd known each other for eons. Carol must have lost track of time. It was supper time, and I hadn't heard from her. Violet and Samuel wanted Teddy to have supper with them. I hadn't yet gotten Carol's number, so I walked next door again, rang the bell, and was greeted again by an even more paint-spattered woman. Hi again. I was going to feed my kids and they'd like Teddy to stay for dinner. If you're alright with that, I'll feed all of them. You are free to join us if you'd like. Can you give me 20 minutes to clean up? I'll take a quick shower and get some clothes on that aren't covered in paint. 20 minutes later, my doorbell rang and there stood Carol dressed in a pair of clean jeans and a man's dress shirt with the tails hanging out and the sleeves rolled up to the elbows. She was carrying a bottle of red wine. Come on in. The kids are in the kitchen. We're having spaghetti and meatballs. I hope that's okay. I've made a salad for us to go with it and I have some garlic bread in the oven. That's great. Teddy loves spaghetti, although we'll probably have to hose him down when he's done. And I like pasta as well. Is your wife here? I wasn't about to share the whole Vera story with a woman I'd known about three hours, so I simply said, I'm a widower. My wife died a little over a year ago. I'm so sorry. I know how painful that is. My husband was a helicopter pilot in Iraq. He was killed in action about two years ago. Now it's my turn to say I'm sorry. I spent two tours in the sandbox as a Marine. I lost several friends over there. It hurts to lose anyone, but especially a spouse. Having realized that my new neighbor was a widow caused me to take a more careful look at her. She was a pretty woman, probably a year or two younger than me, with an attractive face and a nice body. She carried a few extra pounds, but they were distributed mostly to her hips and chest, giving her an hourglass figure that I found quite sexy. 
Carol and I ended up talking for almost two hours. Once the children were fed, we did the dishes together, then sat at the kitchen table with a glass of wine and learned more about each other. Carol was a librarian and had moved here to be closer to her family, allowing Teddy to have a better relationship with his grandparents, who also were available to provide additional childcare support. I told Carol that I'd grown up in foster care and had moved back to the area after my Marine Corps experience in college because my wife had been offered a great job with a big four accounting firm. I'd followed her because I could get a teaching job locally easier than she could find a comparable offer elsewhere. Besides, my last set of foster parents, whom I considered my parents, lives nearby. The kids were clearly getting tired, so we decided to call it a day. Before she left, I told Carol about Maria and added that I'd be glad to watch Teddy anytime if she needed someone on short notice. My teaching job left me free all summer and I was usually home by 4 p.m. most days during the school year. Maria was generally here from 7 a.m. until I got home during the week. Carol seemed delighted with the offer, as her schedule included working one evening a week until 8 p.m. With that settled, Carol and Teddy left for their house, and I began the process of bath and story time before kissing Violet and Samuel goodnight. I had sensed a bit of a spark between Carol and me, but I was still adjusting to my loss of Vera. I wasn't ready to jump into another relationship, particularly given how my marriage to Vera had ended. But it had been five years since I'd been with a woman and my little head had begun to show signs of interest as my conversation with Carol had continued. She'd given no signs of similar interest, but then her loss of a husband was far more recent than Vera's disappearance. I would wait and see what developed. Over the next few months, Carol's family and mine slowly began to merge. Teddy became a fixture in our backyard as well as Violet's best friend in her kindergarten class. I popped over on several occasions to take care of small household repairs that Carol couldn't handle. We had dinner together with the children at least once a week. And we frequently spent a few hours together on the weekends, a glass of wine in our hands while watching the children play in my backyard. It was almost Christmas when I finally worked up the courage to ask her out. I hoped I wasn't misreading the signals I thought she was sending. We'd been spending more time together, carpooling to children's school events and just hanging out. I had qualms about trying to move whatever it was we had from the friend category to the girlfriend category, but I also realized that if I didn't ask, she'd never have the opportunity to say yes. And I was beginning to worry that if I didn't take some action, someone else might swoop in and capture her affections. So one day, as I walked Teddy back to his house after Carol got home, I screwed up my courage and rang her bell. Carol had just gotten home from the library and was still dressed in her business casual attire. She had that sexy librarian look, professional clothing with a blouse unbuttoned down a couple of buttons, some cleavage showing, hair up in a tight bun, reading glasses hung on a chain around her neck. Little Davy popped to attention immediately, but fortunately the jeans I was wearing were stiff enough to conceal my arousal. Hi, what's up? Was Teddy a good boy? He was great as usual. He and Violet finished their homework and then all three kids spent the rest of the time out in the yard. I'm here because I wanted to ask you something. Okay. If I can get a babysitter or arrange to have Maria take care of the kids on Saturday night, would you like to go out for dinner and a movie? I mean an adults-only evening, just the two of us? Carol laughed. Well, she said, it's about time. I was starting to wonder if you were ever going to ask me out. I was going to give you until Christmas break and if you hadn't stepped up, I was going to ask you. Of course, I'd love to go out with you. We've been dancing around this for months. What time Saturday shall I be ready? Let me line up the babysitter and I'll get back to you. And with that, I bid her goodnight and almost floated across the lawn to my own house. Maria was delighted to work a little overtime, particularly because she'd been after me for some time to step back into the dating pool. She'd met Carol and liked her. And she had embraced Teddy as another grandchild. With childcare arranged, I told Carol I'd pick her up at 6 p.m. We'd go casual to a local Italian restaurant that I had enjoyed several times in the past, then see whatever new movie was showing at the local AMC theater. By the time I knocked on her door, I was as nervous as a high school kid on his first date. Carol opened the door and I stood there, stunned. She was wearing a sheer white blouse that was almost see-through and gave glimpses of a lacy bra supporting her quite lovely breasts. 
She also had on a pair of slacks that emphasized her generous hips and, when she turned around, highlighted her very shapely ass. Wow, was all I could say. She slipped her hand into mine and followed me to my car. I opened her door and watched her sit, then closed the door and walked around to the driver's side. I finally recovered my composure and then said, my goodness, if I'd known you cleaned up that nicely I wouldn't have waited so long. You are absolutely stunning in that outfit. Carol found that quite amusing. You've been looking at my rear end for months. Don't think I haven't noticed you doing it. And you certainly look studly yourself. That running and martial arts training seems to be working. The evening flew by. When we got seated in the theater, Carol reached over and took my hand, then leaned her head on my shoulder. I looked down at her, then tilted her head up and kissed her. She responded with enthusiasm. Fortunately, we were seated well to the back, so we weren't making a spectacle of ourselves to the whole crowd. After the movie was over, we drove over to a local bar with a small jazz ensemble and spent an hour listening to the music and talking. When we finally left for home, we walked to the car with our arms around each other's waists. The evening had been a rousing, and a rousing, success from my viewpoint. I was pretty certain Carol felt the same way, since she asked me when we could do this again. I said as soon as we could schedule another evening. And so began the third rescue of my life, the one that finally gave me the lasting, unconditional love that Vera had never been able to provide. We were careful to behave around the kids, but when they were outside playing or asleep, we behaved like two high schoolers. We didn't actually sleep together, but we definitely spent a fair amount of time rounding third without quite getting to home plate. Finally, after two months of this, I asked Maria if she could watch all three children for a weekend so Carol and I could go away together. We picked a romantic-looking bed and breakfast in Lancaster County and left immediately after school on Friday night. Dinner was at a lovely French restaurant in the heart of Lancaster, after which we drove to the B&B and checked in. When we reached the room, Carol excused herself with a small travel bag and went into the bathroom. When she emerged, I stood there, dumbstruck. She had on a garter belt with stockings, a lace teddy that barely contained her breasts and stopped well short of her lower lips, and a pair of high heels. Little Davy Dam near popped the zipper on the pants I was wearing. We spent most of the night making love. Despite my long layoff and her somewhat shorter layoff, neither of us appeared to have forgotten how to please a partner. My recollection of that evening is one of continuous passion and pleasure. Either the B&B's walls had the best soundproofing I've ever experienced or the rooms next to us were empty, because Carol was a most vocal lover, and any neighbors would have gotten very little sleep. At one point, I thought for sure someone would call the cops because of the noise she was making. We fell asleep in each other's arms in the wee hours of the morning and slept until the maid woke us up to clean the room. We made sure the next evening to hang the Do Not Disturb sign on the door, providing us with an opportunity for wake-up sex the following morning before we checked out, from then on, we were a couple. I took Carol and Teddy to meet the Hopkins, who gave me two thumbs up. Carol's parents were equally approving. We spent every possible waking minute together and after talking with all three of the kids about our relationship, began spending the nights together as well. By Memorial Day, I was convinced that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Carol. After talking to Carol's dad and obtaining his blessing, I got down on one knee and proposed at the restaurant where we'd had our first date. Her yes was loud enough to turn every head in the room. We'd both been married before, so neither of us saw the need for a big wedding. We decided to hold an outdoor ceremony in a local park, renting the pavilion for a catered reception. The guests were Carol's family, the Hopkins family, our children, Maria, and a few good friends. Maria agreed to stay with the children for a week while we honeymooned at a resort in the Caribbean, before our wedding, I'd sat Carol down and told her the whole Vera story. I included the generous bequest and the condition that I raise Violet and Samuel. I told her about the trust for Violet and Samuel. I even explained the importance of the necklace I'd given Vera that first Christmas. We discussed what to do about each other's children and decided that each of us would adopt the others. We also talked about having one or more children of our own and agreed that we wanted at least one more. Shortly after the honeymoon, Carol discovered that she was pregnant. Apparently one of the medications she'd taken in preparation for our Caribbean trip had had the effect of cancelling her birth control pill. 
She was concerned that I'd be upset to have a new baby added to the mix while we were still adjusting to our lives together, but I was over the moon. Little George David was born nine months after the wedding. He was followed two years later by Margaret Ann. At that point we called it a day. Carol took a sabbatical to raise the children and I continued teaching. With the two latest additions to our family, we realized that neither house was large enough to serve as a place to raise five children. We purchased a large Victorian-era house with a generous yard slightly further out of the center of town and renovated it, selling both our houses to fund the project. We moved in shortly after discovering we were expecting Margaret, shortly after we were married, I discovered that Vera had left me one final gift. It was a big one. I'd engaged an attorney to prepare the adoption petitions and the usual wills and powers of attorney for Carol and me. In planning the estate distribution, I told him I wanted Teddy to receive virtually all of Carol's and my assets, as Violet and Samuel were generously provided for under the terms of Vera's trust. He asked me for a copy of the trust document so he could reference it correctly in our wills when explaining why our assets were not being distributed equally among the three children. He'd had the papers a few days when he called me. Davy, have you actually read the trust document? No, I haven't. The bank handles everything. With the money Vera left to me, I haven't had to touch any of the trust funds for Violet or Samuel. I don't think I'll need any of those funds until the kids go to college. Why do you ask? Well, I was going through the document and I found a provision that might interest you. It is probably going to cause Carol and you to change your estate distribution plan. What's it say? I won't read the whole thing to you, but the gist of it is that Vera added an additional beneficiaries clause to her trust. If you ended up raising Violet and Samuel, she provided that any children born to you, adopted by you, or stepchildren who are minors at the time of your marriage to their mother are to be added as beneficiaries. Teddy qualifies as your stepchild and will continue to qualify once the adoption is final. Any children Carol and you have will also benefit. That woman must have thought a lot of you to provide for your kids that way. I was dumbstruck. The woman who told me she could never love me the way I deserved and had encouraged me to go on with my life had provided for the children she'd hoped I'd have in a most generous way. She'd guaranteed that those children would never experience the lack of financial or physical security that she'd undergone as a child in foster care. I was overwhelmed at the evidence of her concern for my well-being and that of my children, even from beyond the grave. Carol and I made the necessary adjustments to our estate plans. Our five children will never want for anything, thanks to Vera's generosity. Epilogue I am sitting on our back porch, watching our four older children play in our backyard. Carol is curled up in my lap, head on my shoulder, arms wrapped around me. Margaret is in her carrier, fast asleep. I'm contemplating how rich my life is and how fortunate I've been. I'm grateful to the Hopkins for rescuing me twice from a self-destructive spiral. I'm even more grateful to my sexy, beautiful wife for rescuing me from my life as a single parent. And I'm grateful to Vera for her generous provision for our five children. I still can't quite bring myself to forgive her completely, but I do understand her motivations. She was a product of a flawed system, but in the end, she managed to take one final action that demonstrated, if not love, at least a recognition of my love to her. God bless and keep her.